an introduction to electrostatics. Specifically, we're going to look at how electric charges interact at a basic conceptual level, and we're also going to look at how we can apply this understanding of charge interactions in order to understand how basic electric circuits work. So in 9.1, we're going to look at basic charge interactions, which forms the basis for what we call electrostatics. So charge electrostatics and Coulomb's law, okay? So electric charge in physics is represented by the letter Q. All right, there are two types of charges in the universe, as I'm sure we're all aware, and we've learned from uh, chemistry and biology. There are positive charges and negative charges, okay? And as we're all familiar with, or maybe not familiar with, if you, if you haven't heard the saying, um, if positive and char negative charges interact, an attractive force will result, aka opposites attract. And then if two charges of the same sign interact, um, a repulsive force will result, meaning that the two charges will repel each other. Um, so opposites attract, likes repel, an expression you may have heard, albeit perhaps in the context of something else like maybe romance, opposites attract, um, likes charges repel, okay? So the unit charge we have for, um, the unit that we use for charge in physics is what we call the Coulomb, and it's named after um, French physicist who goes, whose last name was Coulomb, duh. I can't remember his first name, um, but he essentially um, helped formulate and start the study of electric charge interaction. So the most fundamental charge in the universe is the charge of an electron, unless you're considering quarks, which are in particle physics, but we're not in particle physics. So the most fundamental charge is a charge of an electron, which we denote with the letter lowercase e. So the fundamental charge of an electron, and we'll actually talk about how they determine this charge experimentally in class, is E equals 1.602 times 10 to negative 19th coulombs. Okay, so that's the fundamental electric charge in the universe. Okay? This uh, charge is on the AP Physics Equation Sheet, but you should get down to make sure you're familiar with it. Um, because you don't want to waste time looking at your equation sheet, as we've already talked about extensively throughout this year, okay? So what's interesting to note is only integer, integer multiples um, of the fundamental electric charge are allowed. The reason being is everything in the universe is made of protons and neutrons, or excuse me, protons, electrons, and neutrons. Neutrons have zero charge. Electrons have a charge of minus E, and protons have charge of plus E. So since everything is um, made up of protons and neutrons and electrons, we have an integer, integer multiple of protons, electrons, and neutrons, which means that the fundamental electric charge that we have, that the fundamental electric charge that an object has, must be an integer multiple of the fundamental electric charge of the electron, um, E. Okay? Um, in addition, charge is also conserved, like energy and mass. It cannot be created or destroyed, and it can be combined just as energy and mass can be combined, what we call net charge of an object. Um, the reason being is that each object in the universe either um, has some mass to it. Um, so if we think the three fundamental particles that make up the universe, neutron has zero charge, proton has a positive charge, um, positive E, and electron has a, negative, um, has a charge of negative E, okay? Again, each of these objects makes up the universe, um, and each of these objects cannot be destroyed, protons, electrons, and neutrons. Um, so as a result, since they can't be destroyed, the charge that they have is conserved, and their charge can't be destroyed either, okay? So these two last rules right here, only fundamental, inter only integer multiples of the fundamental electric charge are allowed. Um, only integer multiples of the fundamental electric charge are allowed, and charge being conserved are a result of the fact that everything in the universe is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and that these protons, neutrons, electrons cannot change or be destroyed. So we have to have an integer multiple of protons, electrons, and neutrons, which means we have to have an integer multiple of fundamental electric charge, and charge has to be destroyed because protons, electrons, and neutrons can never be destroyed. Okay? As an example of net charge, real quick, consider a water molecule. You may have learned about in chemistry that a water molecule has a um, negative charge at one end, and then two positive charges at the other ends on the hydrogens, okay? So there are parts of the hydrogen molecule, or excuse me, parts of the water molecule that are charged, um, and we'll learn about this down the line in this lesson. It's what we call charge polarization. Um, but the overall charge of our atom, of our, excuse me, water molecule is actually zero because there's actually a charge of negative two right here, and then a positive charge of one right here, positive one, and then a positive one charge right here. Um, which means that the net charge is going to be negative 2 plus positive 1 plus positive 1, which equals 0. 
This should say negative 2 right here, but I think the diagram was just aiming for a visual representation of the charge as opposed to a specific number. So the overall net charge of our water molecule is actually 0, hence why you don't get shocked by, well, water molecules. So Coulomb's Law. So um, Coulomb's Law, the force responsible for the charge interactions between um, two charges Q1 and Q2 separated by distance R is electrostatic or Coulomb force, okay? The electrostatic slash Coulomb force was first written down by the French physicist I was telling you about with the last name Coulomb, and it's used to model this observation that like charges repel while opposite charges attract. So Coulomb's Law um, states that the electrostatic force acting between two charges is equal to K times charge the times the charge on one object times the charge on the other object divided by distance squared. Okay, the Coulomb constant is um, is defined to be 9.0 times 10 to 9th newtons um, newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Again, those are a whole big lot of units, but something you don't have to worry about. You just have to know that it's a constant proportionality that's used to fix the electrostatic um, force throughout the universe. Okay. Um, it's ex this, unit, this number has been experimentally determined, and it can be actually derived from some very advanced physics, but that's not the point here, okay? Um, what you may notice is that the Coulomb force is strikingly similar to the um, universal f force, or the force of universal gravitation. Uh, specifically, K is replaced with um, G, or specifically the... Uh, Big G, the um, universal gravitational constant, is replaced with K, the Coulomb constant, and then the two masses, M1 and M2, are replaced with the charges of the objects Q1 and Q2. Um, but we still have this R squared right here. So the Coulomb force, just like the gravitational force, um, is what we call an inverse square law. The force between charges decreases at rate proportional to the inverse square of the distance. The idea being is that as you separate the forces and they get further away from each other, they're going to, or excuse me, as you separate the charges and they get further away from each other, they're going to have less influence on each other, okay? Just as we saw with gravitation, just as we saw with the gravitational force, okay? And this is strikingly similar. It's actually because there's actually a lot of analogies between electricity and gravity. Um, in fact, th the underlying theory behind classical electricity and classical gravity um, is more or less actually the same. Um, so there's a lot of analogies between the two theories, and it's quite interesting. Um, so let's take a look at methods of charge transfer here, okay? So methods of charge transfer. So charge transfer occurs when negatively charged electrons move from one material to the next, like we see right here, okay? So we have an electron that moves from what we call the valence shell, um, to the valence shell of another atom right here, which you may have learned about in chemistry, okay? If not, do not worry about what a valence shell is or anything is like that. It's just the outermost shell of the electron. It's not anything you'll be tested on in this class. It's more of a chemistry concept, okay? Um, protons are not typically transferred since they are bound inside the nucleus of an atom. So it's mainly electrons that are transferred from one atom to the other, okay? Um, in terms of definitions, insulators are materials that do not readily permit charges to travel through them, such as wood or rubber. Um, so charges, so if you have an insulator, it means that electrical charge cannot flow and move through the, ins, through the material well, okay? Um, conductors, on the other hand, um, readily permit charges to flow and transfer through them, such as metals, which is why we tend to use metals as um, in computers and in technology, okay? Because we say they conduct electricity well. Um, and an interesting little tidbit, um, insulators and conductors for um, electronics actually tend to be ins good insulators and conductors of heat as well, which has to do with an underlying um, quantum theory, what we call quantum statistical mechanics, for those of you all who are interested. Um, but you won't need any of that stuff here in AP Physics 1. Okay? So methods of charge transfer. The first main method we have is what we call the triboelectric effect slash charging by friction. Okay? So, um, if you've ever noticed, like, if you've ever, like, um, had socks on and you've rubbed your socks against the carpet and then you touch something, you'll notice that you get shocked. Or in the case of uh, Mr. Mittens over here, if Mr. Mittens is rolling around on the floor, he may be able to have a bunch of um, packing peanuts stuck to him, um, funnily enough, making a nice and funny meme. Well, this is what we actually call tri the triboelectric effect, and it's nothing more than what we call charging by friction or as I like to call it, brute force charging, um, as we'll explain why in a second, okay? So both insulators and conductors can be charged by rubbing materials together, what we call the triple electric effect. So insulators, they don't conduct electricity well, but that doesn't mean it's impossible to, for them to 
um, transfer electricity. It just means they don't do it as readily as conductors do, okay? Um, so what happens is the atoms of both materials are in contact, transferring electrons from one material to the other depending on the chemical makeup of the material, okay? Um, so the chemical makeup of material um, allows the material to transfer electrons more easily, more charge will be transferred, whereas the chemical makeup of the material does not allow electrons to be transferred as easily, aka it's an insulator, um, less charge will be transferred, okay? So what's happening is these two objects are in contact, these two materials are in contact, and um, electrons from the atoms that are in contact with each other are transferred from the atoms of one material to the atoms of the other material, all right? So it's literally charging you by friction, it's literally ripping electrons from one atom and placing them onto another. Now it does go into more detail than that because it tends out because it um, it turns out that some atoms um, want electrons more than other atoms, which goes into the chemical makeup of the atoms um, and the elements um, and the elements of the material. But that's more again like a, a chemistry concept. So for right now, what you need to know at face value is that some atoms want more electrons than other atoms, and so as a result, when you um, rub two different surfaces in contact. The surface that wants more electrons will rip atom electrons from the atoms of the other surface. Um, as a result, um, that creates electric charge transfer, and that allows you to shock people when you rub your socks against the ground, or allows Mr. Mittens to uh, become en enveloped in packing peanuts when he rolls around in the carpet. So, um, the next main method of charge transfer we have is what we call polarization. Um, and charging by induction. So they're two separate but similar things. And in fact, polarization is actually caused by charging by induction, okay, or can be caused by par charging by induction. All right, so um, polarization is what we call a separation of charges within an object, okay? Um, it tends to be caused by charging by induction, although it's not the only way, but for right now, that's the main way we'll look at, okay? Um, so if you've ever heard, like, people say, like, yeah, the political environment's really polarized, it tends to mean people are really separated and on opposite sides of the aisle. And the same thing happens to polarization in physics is we have separation of charges within an object. So how do we cause polarization, okay? Um, so polarization is what's called by charging by induction. So what happens with induction is a charged object is brought close to, but not touching, an electrically neutral conductor that causes the charges in the conductor to separate, Okay. So if we look at diagram A, diagram one right here, okay, we have two, uh, two conductors A and B that are in contact, and together they make up one whole conductor, okay? If you bring a negatively charged um, balloon close to A and B right here, what's going to happen um, is all the electrons on A are going to be repelled away due to the electrostatic force, and they're going to flee, and they're going to be repelled into um, the conductor B right here. So as a result, that's going to leave you, so as a result, all your electrons are removed from the atoms on conductor A, which is going to leave you with a net positive charge on A and net negative charge on B. However, overall, when you combine A and B together, your net charge is still zero because remember, charge has to be conserved. So the overall net charge of zero that we saw in diagram one is still conserved, it's just that the charges are now separated within each individual object. So we have negative charges repelled into B, leaving us with positive charges on A. All right, so this is what induction is. is this is causing polarization by bringing an object close to, but not touching an electrically neutral conductor. So now what we can do in order to charge these objects is we can um, grab B right here, and B is on an insulator. This, so this stand is insulated, so grabbing B is not going to do anything. And what we can do is we can separate B from A, okay? So tar charge object will, add, will attract or repel negative charges within the conductor, resulting in the conductor becoming polarized. Again, note that the overall charge is zero, as the total charge inside the conductor is still the same, which again is what I just said. It's just now in bullet point form, okay? So now what we do is after separating A and B, okay, um, B is now going to acquire a net negative charge, and A is going to acquire a net positive charge, and once they're fully separated, okay, B, the, char the negative charges on B are going, to are going to redistribute themselves so that the negative charges are far away from each other as possible. And then the positive charges on A are going to do the same thing. They're going to get as far away from each other as possible so they don't have to be next to each other. So they're going to redistribute, which leaves you with a positive charge on A and a positive charge on B, whereas A and B were initially uncharged. Again, please note that the net charge overall of our system is still zero because we have the same amount of positive charge on A as we have the same amount of negative charge on B. So if we combine A and B, the net charge is still zero as we have in one. It's just now that A is individually charged and B is individually charged, okay? 
So this is charging by induction. And then lastly, we have charging by conduction and grounding, okay? Um, so what is charging by conduction, okay? So conduction, um, if you bring two conducting materials, what conduction is, is that if you bring two conducting materials with a difference in charges um, into, into contact with each other, um, there's going to be a charge transfer from one conductor to the other conductor, okay? Um, so as a result, we call that conduction, okay? The two conducting materials are going to transfer charges from one to the other until they both have the same amount of charges and are in what we call equilibrium, okay? Um, so for example, right here, okay, if I have a neutral uh, spherical ball right here, neutral sphere right here, that's a conductor, and I bring a negatively charged um, rod that's also a conductor, and I touch the two, okay, um, there's going to be a, uh, a disparity in charge. This, this rod has negative charge while the sphere doesn't have any charge, so um, the charge is going to flow from the rod into the, into the sphere until they both have equal amounts of charge. So as a result, the charge on the sphere is going, negative charge on the sphere will decrease, or excuse me, the negative charge on the rod will decrease while the negative charge on the sphere will increase. Um, and as a result, when you take the rod away, that will now leave the sphere with a net negative charge. The, so the contact surface of a bridge that allows electrons to move from negatively charged conductor to the positively charged or neutrally charged, or the neutral conductor, okay? Um, and then we also have the phenomena of grounding, okay? So how do we remove, so if we have charged our sphere now, okay, how would we remove charge from that sphere, okay? Well, what we do is we call grounding. Grounding is a phenomenon where we remove electric charge from a conductor, okay? So what we can do is we can take an uncharged conducting reservoir that um, touches a charged conductor, okay, such as a ground or a human, okay? Um, we call this a reservoir because we treat the ground of the earth or we, teach a hum or we treat a human as so large compared to, say, the spherical conductor right here, okay, um, that all charge, that we're able to hold all the charge that the sphere has, and thus all the charge is able to flow from the sphere into us or into the ground. Hence, that's why when you touch a sphere, um, you'll feel shock, but you're not going to feel yourself get shocked continuously because you have an... A sh um, you overall can contain a large amount of charge without being affected. And hence why afterwards when you touch the sphere, the sphere will not be charged because all charge has flowed, has, um, has flowed into you, okay? So in our charge conducting reservoir, such as, us, such as ourselves or, uh, or the Earth, is touched to a charged conductor. And so as a result, um, if the conductor is positively charged, electrons will flow from the reservoir into conductor. All right, so we have a positively charged conductor right here. Our reservoir is going to contain so many electrons that it can donate some electrons um, to flow into our conductor um, and equal out the charge. The reason being is that these electrons are going to be attracted to the positive charges in the conductor. So electrons are going to flow from the, conduct from the reservoir into the conductor when the conductor has a positive charge. Now, if we have a ground right here and we have a negative charge, okay? Um, What's going to happen right here is if we have a ground and a negatively charged conductor, all these negative charges are going to want to get away from each other as far as possible. So if we touch this sphere right here, or we connect this sphere to the ground, that's going to give those electrons an infinite amount of space to get away from each other, so they're all going to flow away from the sphere um, and into the ground, resulting in the sphere becoming uncharged. So in a nutshell, when a sphere is negatively charged, the electrons will flow into the ground to all get away from each other, and then if a sphere is positively charged, um, negative charges will flow from the ground onto the conductor um, as they are attracted to the positive charge on the conductor, okay? And these are our basic methods for charge transfer and electrostatic.